Not a person in this room. Not a person viewing by live stream doesn't like to get a gift. I mean, if I were to ask you, do you like receiving gifts? And you were to say, oh no, I hate receiving a gift. I would think you were odd. I would. I think you're odd. I think almost everybody, if not everybody, loves getting gifts. From those who are young, four or five, to those of us who are middle-aged, 55, those of us who have a little more maturity, 75, I think we all like to get gifts. Matter of fact, we like giving and receiving. But receiving gifts is fun. I mean, we get gifts at Christmas. We like it. We get gifts at our birthdays. We enjoy it. Matter of fact, we give gifts on Mother's Day and Father's Day and Valentine's Day. It's good to give gifts. It's fun. It's fun to receive gifts. Matter of fact, we even do it on Easter. Maybe when you were a kid, uh, you, you ladies, maybe your mom and dad, maybe or your mom bought you an Easter dress and you got to wear it for the first time at Easter or maybe you got new shoes. Getting gifts is fun. Matter, matter of fact, our, our staff, our pastors, our ministers in the children's area, they know that. That's why we give our little preschoolers and children gifts this last week. On Easter Sunday, we gave our kids some gifts, a little sack in that gifts. Of course, you got to give a little candy, and kids like that, preschoolers like that. But there was something else, another gift that was given, and uh, it was the resurrected Jesus. Look at this picture of Jesus right there. That's the resurrected Jesus. I got him right here in my hand. So we're riding in the car. And this resurrected Jesus, of course, was given to my two grandchildren, Michael's children, Misty, who's eight, and River, who's four. And as they're riding in the car, River's playing with her resurrected Jesus, and Misty, for some reason, didn't have hers in her hand. So Misty turns to River and says, hey, River, give me that Jesus. (laughs) And for whatever reason, in that moment, River is being cooperative. She's not always cooperative. So River hands this little baby Jesus over to Misty, and River says this to Misty, the conversation, she says, okay, here's Jesus, but he's not even chocolate. (laughs) Then she says, then she says, his hair is brown, but it's not chocolate. (laughs) Now look, give us a break, even in the pastor's home. Four years old, we're still learning the difference between Jesus and chocolate bunnies, but we're working on that. The point is, we all like gifts. Now, look, will it it bother you if we put resurrected Jesus right here for the message? All right, there we go. We like to receive gifts. Nothing wrong with that. Today, I, I begin here in Pastor Eric in Columbia series entitled Gifted. Every Christian, every Christ follower has been given at least one, if not more than one, spiritual gifts that we are to use to build up, encourage, and equip the church and each other, the body of Christ. They're more than just natural talents. They are supernatural spiritual gifts that we receive from the Lord. Now, we serve a triune God, a Trinitarian God. There are Three persons in the Godhead whom we love and serve. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father, our Creator, is seated on His throne in heaven. God the Son, our Savior, is seated at His right hand in heaven. The right hand is the position of authority, power, honor. However, so to speak, God the Holy Spirit is not seated in heaven with God the Father and God the Son. God the Holy Spirit is here on earth residing in every one of us and in every believer around this planet. God, the Holy Spirit, lives within us. Every Christ follower has within him or her the Spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, John 14, if you have your Bibles, verse 16. John 14. Take your copy of God's Word. If you found John 14, say, got it. All right. Another minute. Look at verse 16. And I, this is Jesus, I will ask the Father, and he, God the Father, will give you, all of us, 
another counselor. That's those, this is the ascension. He's talking to the disciples, and they're gathered on that hillside before Jesus ascends. I'll give you a paraclete, a counselor, one who comes alongside, one who resides within, to be with you forever. Verse 17 said, he lives in you and be with you. The Holy Spirit resides within every one of us, men and women, teenagers and children, who have received Christ. We have the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit living in us. Next week, we'll begin studying some of those gifts over the next three weeks. Today's message, however, we want to talk about the Holy Spirit himself, not the gifts he gives. So today's message, introducing the giver of gifts. We all like to receive gifts. The Holy Spirit has gifts to give us. Now, through the years, I've read many books written about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit over the last 35 or so years. Um, Of late, I've read a couple of books. Before I get to those books, uh, let me tell you that uh, I I love Jack Hayford from Van Nuys, California, Church on the Way. Dr. Hayford, anything he writes uh, on fasting, I love his work. On the Holy Spirit, he's balanced Jack Hayford. Hayford, and you can find him, just find him on the internet. Anything, he's so balanced, and, and if you have a Baptist background, Methodist background, Church of Christ, Catholic, Pentecostal, non-Pentecostal, whatever, Hayford writes, you will love his writing. Now, two books that I've read of late, one is A.W. Tozer's book, Alive in the Spirit. Great book. It's a little easy read if you want to read a book on the Holy Spirit. Now, this one I'm holding in my hand, Holy Fire. We got a picture of this by R.T. Kendall. Dr. Kendall writes such balanced, uh, let me put it. it, it is not written to brainiacs. What I mean by that is you don't have to have an advanced degree to understand the work of Dr. Kendall. You just... Um, I believe, I believe somebody 13 or 14 can read and understand this, or maybe even 12. I'm, I love the way he's written. And he, uh, he like Jack Hickford, is so balanced, so well written. And, and uh, you know, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, sometimes we get nervous or whatever. This is something that everybody's going to love. So if you're looking for a book, read R.T. Kendall. Matter of fact, let me share that much of what I'll share today, and I want to give him credit, much of what I'll share today is not independent study I've done and researched. It's a lot of study he did and what he's written so that, you, uh, that I give Kendall credit for utilizing much of his study as I share this morning. Let's pray together. God, um, today, thank you for your presence. Holy Spirit. Now teach us, as we, we have sensed your presence corporately in worship, we are filled with your presence, Holy Spirit, individually. Now you illumine our minds to hear from you, to hear from the Lord, to hear from the Word of God. And then, Lord, move that. Holy Spirit, move what we hear from our minds to our hearts to our spirits to solidify and seal and hold that in place that we, we might be changed. We might be transformed. Lord, I I yield me to you. Holy Spirit, fill me. And I receive, and I thank you for it. A filling of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when a person stands to teach or preach God's word, or when a person is uh, doing a lecture or a training in your workplace, a lot of times when when they're teaching, they give information. And then they want to do it with inspiration, And then their desire result in the hearers is transformation. I want to just set you up today, maybe a tad more informational about the Holy Spirit. And we'll pray the Holy Spirit comes and makes it inspirational. But today, more be informational. And our prayer is that God will take the information that we receive and somehow inspire us through it and then bring transformation in our life. So anytime you get up to speak, don't just get up with no purpose or no reason. You would like to see transformation, especially in the church. We want transformation to be conformed in the image of Jesus, to be filled with His Spirit, and to live by His Word. So today might be a touch more informational, but we'll trust the Lord to do inspirational work and transformational work in us too. In chapters 14, 15, and 16 in the book of John, Jesus is telling His disciples, His friends that He had lived with, worked with, walked with, ministered with for three years... Every day for three years, he's saying, guys, gals, I'm going away. And he's there on this hillside. He said, I'm going to be gone. 
And, you know, when you live with a leader who is inspiring and transformational and just and defies nature, and you've seen what no other people have seen close up, and then you've seen the miraculous, and your heart has been challenged and changed, man, and then they, all of a sudden they say, hey, guys, I'm about to, I'm about to be out of here. Man, that, that makes you nervous. That, and, then, and then he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And they say, what, what is this? We, we want you. So there's some nervousness, there's some uncomfortable feelings on their part. And the truth is today, when we begin a series on the Holy Spirit, sometimes a pastor or a teacher understands that there's some nervousness in the hearers. Uh, uh, especially, shh, if you didn't know, this is a Baptist church. Shh. Okay, when we talk about the Holy Ghost here, let me just mess you up. We talk about the Holy Ghost. It makes us nervous. You know what I thought about that? After about 35, 36 years of really being serious about God and about the Lord, about His Word, about the Spirit, about Jesus, I found that most through these three plus decades of really being serious about Jesus, that the times I grow most and what I get most out of spiritual things is when I am a bit uncomfortable. I'm not growing as much when I'm just really comfortable in my little routine. When everything's copacetic and everything's just like it ought to be in my world. It's, it's when I'm a little nervous, a little uncomfortable. That's when things can be rearranged in me that need to be rearranged. Some pressure on me, a little nervousness. It's, it's like a rubber band. You understand a rubber band has zero value unless it's stretched. And if you're trying to bind something together and it's too small, what do you do? You double or triple the rubber band until it becomes stretchy so that it can compress. Friends, we're not growing much unless we're stretched. Lord, Lord, let's invite the Holy Spirit to stretch us today if we need to be stretched in these coming weeks. So I want us today to talk about a few. I can't cover many. Just a few of the powerful, important truths about God, the Holy Spirit. Thought number one, and, and I didn't put these necessary in priority order, but if I had to say one, which I don't like to do, I, I would probably say I have to put this at the top or near the top. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Ladies and gentlemen, He is not secondary or tertiary. He's not third on the list. It's not like importance, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and, and you know we don't talk about the Holy Ghost much. He is God. The Holy Spirit, here's a a few examples of Him being God. The Holy Spirit is present at the beginning of time when creation occurred. He was here when creation occurred. He's always been. Genesis 1-2, if you're writing this down or taking notes that we provide through the internet. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit was present when all of this was formed. Second thought, sub-thought. The prophets of old in the Old Testament spoke the words of God as they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1, 21. No prophet in the Old Testament spoke out of his human intuition, his human intellect, or his human passion. He spoke because the Spirit of the Lord fell on him. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1, 21. Here's a third thought. The Holy Spirit enables us to enter the kingdom of God. Guys and gals, we can't even get in the kingdom. We can't be a follower of Christ. We can't come to know God personally without the Holy Spirit. Impossible. John 3, 5 says this, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. John clearly tells us nobody can become a Christ follower unless born of the Holy Spirit. Who is it? Well, here's a question. What does a person have to know and understand before about himself, herself, before he can be saved? We've got to know we are anybody. A sinner. We're lost. How do we know we're a sinner? How do we know we're lost? The world doesn't tell us that. The world says, hey, whatever you want, whenever you want, wherever you want, just so you don't hurt anybody. I mean, that's the compass of our morality. 
You can do whatever you want. You just don't hurt anybody, okay? Let me tell you, it is the Holy Spirit that convicts me of sin, convicts you of sin. It is the Holy Spirit that says, hey, you're missing the mark. The Holy Spirit says, you're, you're not being fulfilled. It's the Holy Spirit that prompts says there's more to it than this is shown in the world. The Scripture says he must be born of water and the Spirit. I won't stay long here, and there's a lot of different thoughts when you study commentaries on this let me tell you what i tell you this you got to be born twice you got to be born naturally got to be born supernaturally i believe this water is talking about the water in the womb every baby in a mother's womb is encased in a protective womb how's that gotta be careful how i do this and inside that womb is the what, embryonic fluid it's it's water kind of stuff that like keeps that baby moist and like that's good stuff. You don't want to dry out up in there, okay? So, boy, I better get out of this in a hurry. How do I do this? Okay, so that's the water, and the water breaks, and the baby comes. I don't, I don't think that's anything. I think that's natural, born of water, and then you got to have that second birth, which is supernatural. Now, if you want to believe it's something different, that's cool, but I think that just symbolizes a natural birth, supernatural birth. Being born once gets you into this world. Being born twice gets you into the next world. I want to be born twice, and we can only do that by the Holy Spirit. That's moving on. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, look, look at uh, John 16, still in the book of John, verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is good for you that I am going away. Unless I go away, the paraclete, Greek word counselor, come alongside, comes into you, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. When he comes, he'll convict the world of guilt. Remember, he convicts the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. In verses 7 and 8, Jesus speaking of the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, the third part of the Godhead, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. He says, him and he. Now, Tom, why is that important? Ask me. Say, Tom, why is that important? He didn't refer to him as it. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. He, the Holy Spirit. He, he, he is not just some mysterious force out there somewhere. It. But when you come in here, and uh, ladies, uh, when your friend says, Oh, how'd you get to church today? And you say, Well, it drove me. The Holy Spirit is a person. We don't refer to our spouse, someone we love, someone close to us as it. It cooked my dinner. <laughs> when I think of it, what do you think of? Is it cousin it? Was it that like furry creature, Adam's family or something? The Holy Spirit. So let, let's look at some traits of a person, the Holy Spirit, the person. The Holy Spirit is a person who can be grieved. Uh, you know, grieved, what does that mean? It means that you can hurt the heart of the Holy Spirit. It means when the Holy Spirit prompts you to do one way and you do another. Verse 30, Ephesians 4 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit, with whom you were sealed at the day of redemption. You were signed, sealed, and delivered to God. Your name was written in the Lamb's book of life by the Spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, by the way, uh, you know, when, when do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Sometimes when we lose our temper. Now, we, we get angry and, it, and we lose our temper. By the way, you realize we can be angry and not sin. Becoming angry is not a sin. It's how you let that anger flesh out become sin. You know that. The Bible actually says, be angry and sin not. Jesus was righteously angry when he took that whip and he drove the money changers out of the temple of God. He says, this is to be a house of prayer and you've made it a den of thieves. So ladies and gentlemen, hey, hey, we get angry. Things make us angry, but how do you channel that? How do you flesh that out? How do you hold that in? How do you curtail that? Then how do you express your displeasure, but do it in a non-sinful way? Because when we just let it come out and burst onto somebody man that that's sinful like okay this week 
I was doing an amazing job of Michael was working, Leanne was working one evening, and, and uh, I was doing an amazing job. I'm like the best papa babysitter ever. And so River and Misty are upstairs doing, I mean, some really educational stuff, and they're watching TV. And, uh, hey, they're watching that school bus that shrinks and goes in your nostril, whatever that one is. I mean, that's good stuff. I mean, I, they're not watching, like, some voodoo. So being the great papa babysitter that I am, I'm, like, downstairs doing my own thing like papas are supposed to do. So I just go upstairs to check on them. Like every 30 minutes, you got to go check on your 8-year-old Misty and your 4-year-old River because you got to make sure there's no blood, okay? And like if there's no blood, then everything's all right. So I go back up into our bonus room. Many of you got a bonus room. It's the room over the garage. You finish out, you put a big TV on the wall to hypnotize your kids. (laughs) So they're watching like this shrunken school bus going up through the nasal membranes or whatever. And River, I'm not up there at the time, River sees these two giant pieces of styrofoam and uh, evidently the shrunken school bus going in your nose or veins or wasn't enough to entertain her. So she takes this styrofoam and breaks it into every single tiny tens of thousands of, you know that big styrofoam's made out of little yeah. bitty balls of styrofoam? Do you know how many thousands upon thousands so I come up I mean like every 30 minutes how she did this in 30 minutes is like unbelievable the whole room it like it snowed inside (laughs) so when I come up there here's an opportunity for PT not to grieve the Holy Spirit I failed (laughs) I failed River (laughs) what are you thinking not exactly like that. I mean, that's what I felt. I, hopefully, I didn't do that bad. But I could either, like, contain my anger and say, Oh, River. <laughs> that's not exactly what that styrofoam was intended to be for. But I appreciate your creativity. <laughs> Let, let's work together to clean this up. I, I didn't do that. I said, River, what were you thinking? It's a mess. And then I, and then I turned to Misty. Misty, you're eight years old. Like, Misty didn't, did not pop one styrofoam. Not, it's not her. She didn't do it. You know, she, she watched <laughs> the whole time. 100, 1,000, 10,000 pieces. River just, I mean, River's breaking and Misty's watching. Like, like, I know River's doing it. I know Misty's smart watching it. I know Misty knows that probably shouldn't be done. But not one time does she say, Papa, might want to come check on my little sister. Not one time. Instead, she watches. I think she says, this is going to be great when Papa gets here. (laughs) So I said, Misty, why didn't you like at least call me? So, of course, Mom and Nana get on to me saying that Misty's eight years old. She's not responsible. She's, am I my sister's keeper? (laughs) Threw the Bible out at me. The point is, is I had a perfect opportunity to not grieve the Holy Spirit this week and and you know what I have to do? Say, hey, Lord, thank you for forgiveness. Let's start over. And then I say, Michael, that's your kid. Y'all clean it up. <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> so don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, not only do we not grieve the Holy Spirit, the Bible says we, we shouldn't resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit may be resisted, but we sure shouldn't do that. Verse 51, Acts chapter 7, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts, your hearts have not been open to the Lord. And your ears, I mean, you just don't hear. You're just like your fathers. You, you resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is prompting you to do or say or go or feel or experience. And you just say, we say, no, I'm not going there. I, I'm not willing to be that open to God. I'm not willing to say yes to go on a mission trip. I'm not willing to give of my finances. I'm not willing to go to my neighbor and invite him to a connect group party that we're having. And the Holy Spirit's prompting and you know you should do whatever. And you just say, no, that's resisting. And that is sin when we resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit thinks and knows. It is a person. Huh, sorry, he is a person. And the Holy Spirit thinks and knows. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 says, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. 
Now, years ago here at Thompson Station Church, back when we were up in what's now the offices, that was our worship center, and uh, Reagan Wagner, our church planner in Cincinnati or Springboro, and you might know Ryan, his brother and their wife, they're both in our church. Uh, Ryan Wagner coaches at the middle school with Mark Montgomery basketball, and I helped them. Uh, their dad, Robert Wagner, was our worship pastor part-time. He was uh, the leader in worship at uh, Baptist Sunday School Board that became Lifeway. Well, Robert uh, taught us a song, and it was powerful. I mean, the choir and the band and the people. I mean, we were, we were like on our feet. When we sang this song, it was so powerful. We were so moved that like we were like singing and shouting and raising our hands and like throwing our babies in there. I mean, it was strong, strong. Maybe... Maybe you remember it, some of you. Send it on down. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Wow, that's not too bad for me. <laughs> Heavenly Father, hear our call. Let your Holy Spirit fall. Powerful song. After we sang that song, a time or two, it just dawned on me, and I had, a, I had a talk with Pastor Robert. I said, you know, I love that song. It's a powerful song. God moves in that song, but you know, when we sing it, it's just a touch off. And he says, really, tell me. Uh, I think uh, Jaron or Jaron or Jaron Davis, and it's anointed. I don't want to say anything about his lyrics. It's a powerful song. But the truth is, the lyric says, send it on down. We changed it at Thompson Station and sang, Send him on down, send him on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Send him on down. The Holy Spirit is not an it. He's a person. And we respect him and reverence him. He is God and he is a person. Third thought, the Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. Jesus was speaking in... John 16, 14, and basically what he says in this verse, the Holy Spirit will make Jesus famous in this world. For he will glorify me, John 16, 14, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. How did the authors of the Old and New Testament write the book? By the Holy Spirit. What did he tell his disciples? He was gone. This was not written while he was here. It was written by the disciples of the New Testament when he was gone. He said, I'll bring to memory, to remembrance, everything you need. The Holy Spirit brought it to memory. All their life experience, all what they understood. That's why you and I got to saturate our mind with the Word of God, blessed by the Spirit of God. In the right time, he'll bring the remembrance of God in his Word to us. That's why you got to spend time with him in his Word and in his Spirit. So he'll make famous Jesus to this world. The Holy Spirit will lead us to praise and honor Jesus. Verse 14, he will glorify me. That, that Greek word is doxazo. For you who grew up in a denominational church like me, when I say doxazo related to worship or music, what does that make you think of? Doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. To glorify God, to glorify Jesus. The Holy Spirit will lead us to praise and honor Jesus. Jesus deserves all the praise that we can give him and more. And more. If there are some weak points in the Western church, and I think there are, one of those, if I had to just blurt it out, if somebody said, tell us a weak point of the, of the modern Western church, I would say, we don't talk about Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, -S, enough. Sometimes wanting to be non-confrontational, wanting to be accepted, we feel more comfortable talking about God in the community, even in our talks, our speeches, our lessons, or even in the messages sometimes, that we don't talk about Jesus enough. We talk about God. The difference is, is I'm afraid that sometimes when we talk about God that way, we start talking about God with a small g. And do you know what God with a small g means? It means their understanding. Maybe you don't mean it, but they hear it. The world hears it. Your neighbors hear it. Your coworkers hear it who don't know Christ. They hear that small g when you just talk about God in generic. You know what they hear? They hear the God that I choose to make a God see because the world says we don't mind God just let everybody get their own God and then and then they get to decide because I don't have to have anybody else tell me what God I should have the problem is is any old God won't do 
last couple of weeks, we were talking about India, friends. There are, what, Larry, 300,000 gods in India with Hinduism? Three million, I mean, like zillions. I mean, just because you can pick one up. Ladies and gentlemen, when you and I talk about God, we all talk about God with the big G, which means there's only one God, and you can't talk about the big G God, Jehovah God, without talking about His Son and His Spirit. That triune God we worship. So let's, let's make Jesus famous. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. You know, Charles Wesley. Is that a name any of y'all recognize? Charles Wesley. He had a brother named John. Founders of the Methodist movement. The Methodist church today exists because God worked through the Wesley brothers. Did you know that Charles Wesley wrote 6,000 hymns? Not 600, 6,000 hymns, songs of praise. In 19, excuse me, in 1738, Charles Wesley became really, really sick. I mean, didn't know he would live. He had pleurisy. Pleurisy is an inflammation in the lungs. I hadn't studied that, but I thought that was from remembrance, and I had an RN verify that between the services. So pleurisy is a lung issue. He's laying in the ground. No, excuse me, he's not yet. He's not dead. He's laying in the bed, thinking he may end up in the ground. And while he's really sick, several men and women who are Christ followers who know him and love him came and just ministered to him, loved him, prayed over him, did practical things, just cleaned up his house, sang over him, and, and read scripture to him. He recovers from that. He's so moved by Christians coming and caring. I mean, you want to be like Jesus, ladies and gentlemen? You don't have to be brilliant. You, you don't have to be the best at anything. You just have to show up and care. You got that? I mean, that could mean shoveling mulch at somebody's house like we had, we had connect groups doing yesterday. Leanne and I got to eat dinner. Um, unfortunately, we showed up at 5 for the dinner. We didn't show up at 2 for the shoveling, but, you know, we got there for the good part. So our connect classes are ministering because they just showed up in care. See, that's, that, that represents God well. And that... You know what that does? That makes Jesus famous. And so Wesley, a year after that, is with John, and they just have talking. So this is 1739, and they just get together, John and Charles, and they travel circuit preachers, starting churches everywhere and revivals. And they're just talking. And one of them, I don't know how the, nobody knows how the conversation started, but basically, you remember a year ago at this date, we thought like you were going to die and go be with Jesus, but God raised you up. And do you remember how those days that brothers and sisters in Christ in that little town came and loved you and took care of you and fed you and prayed over you and sang over you and ministered to you? And, and, and Charles was so moved, a year after the fact, he wrote a hymn, one of his 6,000 hymns. And the hymn he wrote was one you may be familiar with, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. And Charles Wesley wasn't talking about, I wish there were a thousand people gathered to sing at once. He was saying, God, I wish that I could better sing the praise of Jesus a thousand times more than I do. Friends, you and I can never praise Jesus enough. We can never do that. And the Holy Spirit will move us to that. And when the Holy Spirit's working in our hearts, we want to give Jesus praise. We want to love the Lord God with all of our heart, soul, spirit, strength. Here's the last thought. The Holy Spirit will give us power. I mean, in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit fell, and Pentecost happened, and the church was birthed and exploded. Those 3,000 men and all their wives were gathered. Do you understand how the church was birthed? They were gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover, because they were Jews from dispersed all over. But then when the Holy Spirit came, they became believers. And each family and each small group that had traveled from hundreds of miles around left Jerusalem and basically took the gospel to the world because now they became not Old Covenant, but the New Covenant people because they were before looking forward to the coming of Jesus. Now they actually look back at the, that Jesus did come and they had that was sealed by the Holy Spirit when he came in Acts chapter 2. So the missionaries were dispersed from that Passover, which we know to be Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And, and Acts 2, 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered one place. That's the 120. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were seated, where they were sitting. 
they saw, each of them saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated, came down and separated and rested on each one of them. The Holy Spirit is for everybody, not just a select, sanctified few. Verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they began to speak in languages they'd never studied or learned. They spoke with other tongues as what? The Holy Spirit empowered or enabled them to do. Now, most of the present-day work of the Holy Spirit is more spiritual in nature, not quite so physical or visible in its manifestations. But this time, God was making a point. He was indicating the power and presence of God, the Holy Spirit, and He was doing it by something so supernatural that they could hear and see and speak of it. So what God spoke to my heart this week in preparation for this message is, listen to these who were gathered in that place, these early followers of Jesus. When the Holy Spirit came upon them, they heard something they'd never heard before. They saw something they'd never seen before. And they spoke something they'd never spoken before. Translate that from then to now. No different. Same God, same Spirit, same Jesus same people of God, when you and I are truly filled with the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit, immersed in the Spirit, soaking in the Spirit, saturated in the Spirit, you name it, when we have the Spirit of God on us and in us, then and truly then, we'll be hearing things differently, we'll be seeing things differently, and we will speak things differently because we'll be different. God, that's what we need. That's what I need. That's what we need. The Spirit gives us power. And if you and I walk without power, and I'm not saying we're not Christians, that's not the point here. But if we live a mundane life, and we're no different from our neighbor who is lost as my golf ball on hole number six, deep in the woods. Listen, never, you know, listen, they don't know Christ. But if our lives are not different, if we don't hear differently, see differently, and speak differently then that's because we haven't spent time with God and been marinated and filled with, touched by, baptized in or with the Holy Spirit. This morning, as our staff was praying, after we prayed, we do every week in a prayer circle at like 8.15, I, inadvertently I eavesdropped on Leanne and Pastor Larry. It wasn't on intentional. I was just standing there and I heard this conversation. And their conversation went like this about intimacy with God. And they both declared, it takes more than just doing your 20 minutes or if you're spiritual, 30 minutes or if you're super spiritual, 40 minutes with God and checking a box saying, I read the Bible. And checking a box saying, I listened to a praise song on a CD. Checking a box saying that I actually prayed for 17 people on a list. All that's great. Keep doing that. But there are times, ladies and gentlemen, that checking a box is not enough. That you and I have to get with God alone and maybe not read anybody else's book. Maybe we read God's Word. We invite the Holy Spirit to come and we sit and listen and say, God, speak. I'm listening. And begin to just trust that God's going to speak to our mind. Maybe jot those thoughts down in a journal. But then just say, Lord, I need a touch. I need you. I need a fresh touch of God. Years ago, Jim Simbola wrote a powerful book, he and his wife, in uh, New York City, Brooklyn Tabernacle. Fresh wind, fresh fire. Friends, I, I need it. I think we need it. We need fresh, holy fire. And that only comes when the Holy Spirit is in us and on us and working through us. And the truth is, is that does not come to those who sit idly back and are perfectly comfortable without it. That comes when you and I make the effort and spend the time to press in. Maybe this week, would you declare, I'm cutting out one hour, whenever that is, to go sit in a park, get a bottle of water, and say, Lord, touch me freshly. Touch me, feel me, change me. I'm yours.